Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, the Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Thank you for joining us once again for another in our series of Just Conversations. I am most pleased to welcome on this afternoon to this conversation, Zephyr Teachout, author of the recently released book, Break Em Up, Recovering Our Freedom from Big AG, Big Tech, and Big Money. She is also a formal politi former political candidate and currently Associate Professor of Law at Fordham University. We are also happy to have her as a student here at Union Theological Seminary in the Master of Divinity program. I have no idea how you do it all, Zephyr, but thank you for taking the time to join us in this conversation. Well, it is such a pleasure and a real honor um, to be in this conversation. I really uh, look forward to it. We've got a lot to talk about. Well, I was going to say, we have lots to talk about. And this conversation with you becomes even more timely, if not urgent, given the continued uh, assaults, if you will, on the results of our most recent presidential election. So let us start there. It seems that we have now moved from failed attempts at voter suppression toward attempts at voter nullification. So there are many issues here to discuss, but I wanna focus for a moment uh, at the 15th Amendment, which presumably protects uh, the voting rights, particularly of those persons, i.e. Uh, black persons whose voting rights have historically been under siege. So it's no accident in many ways to me that the, uh, states that are a part of the focus uh, or are the focus for this current attempt of voter nullification, as were the cities in those states that the earlier attempts at voter no, uh, nullification have a disproportionately black electorate. So politics notwithstanding, once again, black voting rights are being attacked. So it leads me to the fragility of the 15th Amendment that said that one could not be disqualified from voting because of race, yet it left wide open the door to put forward other disqualifying uh, aspects that don't mention race, but we know are intentionally raced. So it leads me to ask you this, how effective is the 15th Amendment when it comes to protecting our voting rights? Well, um, it's got quite a storied history um, and is a powerful amendment along with the 13th and 14th amendment. And in the early days after these amendments, there really was a, a show not only of the power of the amendments, but of legislation that uh, passed around the same time against violence, against voter suppression, which then came to a pretty screeching halt in the um, 1870s. And what you see after that is activists really working to say, okay, well, if states are gonna deny these rights, let's turn to the courts. And you are familiar, everybody's familiar with Plessy versus Ferguson, but one of the worst Supreme Court cases, I think, ever that doesn't get nearly enough attention was written by um, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1903, um, where uh, voters raised a 15th Amendment claim because they were being denied the right to register to vote on, on uh, because they're black. It was very obvious. And, and Holmes doesn't deny it in the case. And in that case, what he says is um, two things. Basically, I can't remedy this because if I remove the state's entire voting mechanism, then the court would have to put something in its place. And we just can't do that. We have no power to remedy it. And also, 
um, by the way, the court just doesn't have the power to act in, in this case. And it, you know, I think there's sometimes a tendency to be over deterministic and say, well, it had to be as bad as it was. <laughs> but the court had an opportunity at that moment to step in and say, no, the 15th Amendment is real and it's meaningful. And you cannot deny people the, the right to vote on the base of race. And I, it, even papers at the time recognized how shameful it was. But we have swept that history under the rug. And so to your point about all of these amendments, I think there's a, we are clinging to an era in American history in the um, 50s, 60s, and 70s, where the Supreme Court truly substantially meaningfully intervened. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for instance, recognized the right of one person, one vote, um, which for most of American history didn't exist. and by the way, not by the way, but fundamentally deprived um, uh, uh, cities and places with majority black populations of, of voting power. But we still hold on to the idea of the court as this heroic institution um, that that can that can save us from um, uh, from politics. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we're really struggling with this moment when you have five justices to the right of Justice Roberts. Yeah, yeah. So, who struck down the Voting Rights Act, or, or a key part of it. It's so like how we think of the court and how we think of the Constitution can be separated. You can celebrate the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and still have real questions about the institution of the court. I mean, how do you think of the? Yes, no, you're right. So let's so let's look at this because this is the issue, right? And we talk about our sort of systems of checks and balances uh, with the uh, three branches of government and how they're to hold each other in check. Well, let's. It's a good point to look at these sort of reconstruction amendments because one, they turned on an election. Right, as you talk about uh, the 1870s, they turned on the Rutherford B. Hayes election and the compromise uh, to get Rutherford B. Hayes in, an electoral college compromise, by the way. Here we are again. So in many respects, we are seeing these quote unquote civil rights or even political rights being, or social rights being turned on an election because now here we are at this time and we've seen what's been going on in our country over the past four years. At the same time, we've got a, the, the courts have always been politicized, but an overtly sort of politicized court. So how do we tease this out? What happens now when we have such a politicized court uh, and it re, we rely on the court to interpret and help enforce the Constitution. So where are we then? What happens to these most vulnerable communities, right? Uh, in, 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 in relationship to the Constitution, can we say, I mean, at one point, Charles Mills says that, you know, look, this has always been a race social contract. We know that the Constitution uh, in, it is intrinsically raced. So are we saying that people of color, marginalized communities cannot rely on the Constitution for, to protect any of their rights, especially when we have a politicized court? Um, well, <laughs> I, I think there's, I, it's really important and I wanna make it worse before I make it better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 and I wanna turn to you for making it better. But it's just like, let's just be honest about uh, other really deep structural problems with our constitution, um, namely the Senate. Uh. <laughs> that little problem. <laughs> no, so I, 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 when I say that we're in sort of a foundational moment, the Senate clearly is a uh, allocation of power yeah. that has stood in the way of uh, Black people's political rights um, for the, the country's history. So we have both the Senate and the court. And I, I mean, I mentioned Roberts because for so long, he sort of managed to keep people buying into the legitimacy of the current court. I mean, do you remember the week that he struck down um, the Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, 
which, which by the way, he had been trying to do forever, even as he was an intern uh, with, with, who was it, Rehnquist? Yes. So he, he, at that same day, within 24 hours, the court um, then strikes down DOMA, yes. a major victory um, for civil rights. And so it was clearly, when you understand Roberts, it's clearly a political move to say, um, to sort of maintain legitimacy of the court so that we see the court as a heroic institution that occasionally messes up, <laughs> as opposed to a deeply problematic, oligarchic, increasingly partisan institution that occasionally gets it right. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I do think it's important um, uh, because it, the answer then, of course, isn't to give up. It's just to be honest about the depth of the structural barriers and to not then, and you know, I'm a lawyer, I believe in, in pursuing the litigation and calling on the best parts of our history while being honest about uh, the worst parts, which are ongoing. But it does mean that the pressure has to be in the political sphere. And I think just to go back to your first example, which I uh, first sort of uh, discussion of this moment. The lawsuits that um, extraordinarily 17 state AGs, and I, I forget the most recent number of elected lawmakers are supporting, yeah. are, 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 are insane. They're a, you know, they're a, they're a D on a law school exam. <laughs> they do not pass muster, and they know that. Mm -hmm. They know that what they're doing right now is really making a claim about what is a fraudulent vote, <laughs> who is a fraudulent voter. Right. And it's very clear in the language of Trump and others when he says, we can't let Detroit yes. decide this election. Like, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Detroit, exactly. You know, you know, it's so it's it's not about it's about a real rejection of the possibility of law yeah. and um, and and saying this is not about law. Here is a vision of who belongs in a political community, who is illegitimate, who is fraudulent in this political community. And I think it requires then it's 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 a sort of explicit use of the sword of law in a non law way to say law doesn't exist and we're the political community. And it's incredibly dangerous, incredibly dangerous. Well, I mean, no, I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. And, yeah. uh, but yes, it's dangerous. but it reminds me of, while we're in these amendments, the 13th Amendment, and even right. as you were talking about this, right, in so many respects, I mean, we all know, well, in a couple of, in less than a week, the anniversary of the certification of the 13th Amendment, uh, December 18th, uh, is upon us. Well, the 13th Amendment in and of itself had a major loophole, right? That was almost the beginning of our uh, mass incarceration, uh, where it said that you can't be, no one can be held in slavery except as punishment for a crime. Well, here, here we go. And then they began to uh, in this post reconstruction era, practically criminalizing everything that had to do with black life and black living uh, at that time. So, which also only because of a crime can you be disenfranchised. So we, we see how these work together. But there's another part of that 13th amendment and in what you're talking about now again is a violation of it, that there shall be no sort of repetition of the badges and accidents of slavery. Yeah. Uh, so here we are. So Zephyr, does this mean then if we can't rely on the enforcement of the amendments themselves, forget the interpretation of them by the courts, if we can't rely on the enforcement of them, then we are left with civil rights actions and civil rights acts like the Reconstruction Acts or the Voting Rights Acts, but then they uh, can, of course, be uh, nullified by the court. So my question is, in this democracy that is ours, what, what is our recourse? And, and, and perhaps that leads us, what, what becomes the role of not only political actors, but of, of the faith community? Where are we to go with this? Wow, you, there's a, so much there. And I, I just want to pause on something because you mentioned it in passing and you probably talked about this in prior um, uh, 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 
uh, Facebook Lives, but I but I really think it's really un important to understand. There's you have the Thirteenth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. The Thirteenth Amendment um, understood at the time, and I am by no means an originalist, <laughs> but understood at the time, um, even without acts of Congress, um, to uh, to prohibit a broad array of activities, not. Uh, certainly slavery itself, but also a broader penumbra around um, around slavery. And at the same, and then and then you have the Fourteenth Amendment, which has this clause in it um, that shows up basically in a in a uh, complicated framework, saying states are allowed um, or won't be punished for. I want to be precise because I think that um, the uh, uh, the uh, the doctrine around this is wrong, <laughs> that basically says states won't be punished in their representation if they deny people the right to vote on the basis of participation in rebellion or another crime. Hmm. And um, that section of the 14th Amendment, which said you can still get your representatives if you deny people the right to vote on the basis of participation in a crime, has been used against very powerful court challenges to say that states have an absolute right to deny um, incarcerated people the franchise. But there's a pretty core tension between these two. Because <laughs> like, if you want to talk about the badges and incidents of slavery, right. then you have to talk about the black codes That's right. and the sort of early efforts to um to criminalize blackness and the growth of um uh the criminalization uh, basically the removal of the franchise from incarcerated people that happens right in these 1880s era that it's and it's for a reason it's for a very particular reason so you have to understand the um, not just mass incarceration, but deprivation of the right to vote of those who are incarcerated okay. as a direct badge and incident of slavery, <laughs> as a, a sort of historical matter and as an ongoing matter. And, for, uh, and so I, I see this case, Richardson versus Ramirez, this case um, that rejected the argument, a very strong argument that it's a, a there's a real 14th Amendment problem, equal protection problem for depriving people of the right to vote um, when they're incarcerated, regardless of what crime they committed. You know, at the time this is passed, we're talking about a fraction of the number of uh, criminal laws that we have today as actually one of the most dangerous. Another case that deserves more attention, along with Giles versus Harris, that other that other case that I mentioned. So, so I'll get forward to your question, but I but I think it's important, and I also think that what you are doing in honoring these amendments and the seriousness of them is part of the political project to deal with this moment. Mm -hmm. So that it is calling on, uh, in an honest way, calling on the best aspirations of our history without lying about <laughs> the worst part is really important because, because history has so much power and people are looking for ways to call on history and not, we need to create a world that's never been created. That's right. But, but not to create it without calling on those whose um, wisdom we are drawing on and shoulders we are standing on. But I do think to answer your question, I'd love to hear what you think um, that, that we, we just can't deny that we have to, like, I don't, it'd be great if there was a Supreme Court that acted in the way that you might imagine. But while we work to reform the court, we've got to be engaged in politics in a very serious way. So how do you see the role of the faith community? Yeah, no, thanks, well, I, yeah, I, I like what you're saying. We, ha we are called to create a world that we have not created yet. And so a part of the faith community's role, I think, is to help us uh, to reimagine uh, justice 
even as we have to be this sort of moral voice pushing us forward on the public square. So Zephyr, and it brings me, I love what you say about this taking seriously our history, the history of these amendments and how these amendments in so many ways are the focus in so many respects of what's going on here today. So that people, we know, let's hope, that all of the challenges to this current election are going to be turned away. And we know that there are all kinds of self-centered uh, uh, and self-serving reasons that this president uh, is pushing these challenges, right? But when they go away, it's not as if the problem goes away. And what this era has shown us are the vulnerabilities, not only of these amendments that in so many ways for people who look like me are the core of our presumed freedom, uh, uh, but the vulnerabilities of our democracy so that in some ways this, this moment, we are led to this moment to somehow empower people to say it's not over, that our democracy is at stake. So what do you, and, and the faith community has to be involved in that that truth telling. So I want to ask you, what do you see? I, this movement has revealed so many vulnerabilities, I think. Uh, and in this way, this past administration's uh, a blessing, uh, a cursed blessing in revealing to us the fact that we cannot become complacent and that there are built in vulnerabilities, particularly for people who look like me. So what do you see? What are your see as the biggest threats? What what are the moments that keep you up at night when it comes to uh, our, the fragility of where we find ourselves now and not as a democracy, but even our democratic vision? <laughs> the biggest crack, it's hard because in some ways it's, um, wait, it's sort of, I, I, another way to ask it is where are the places of strength? <laughs> <laughs> That might be easier to answer. <laughs> because so there are, uh, you know, that the, a source of strength is to me a vision of the radical rule of law, which we have never had. And the radical rule of law, the idea that each person is actually meaningfully, not superficially, <laughs> Um, seen in the eyes of the law and treated in the eyes of the law um, as equal. That's what law should mean. That's even the idea of law as opposed to rule by individual or rule, you know, or arbitrary rule. That is a very beautiful, unachieved idea, but there's a source of power in it. <laughs> there's a reason that it has been at the heart of both the first and the second reconstruction. <laughs> Um, that is a source of power. I do think that the, the, the puncture to complacency is important. I, oh, yes. <laughs> you know, I turned 18 when the, when the wall came down, the Berlin wall, and there was sort of okay, so Okay, you just much... aged me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There was so much, um, and in a, like an entire generation, a sense of like, we basically solved problems and if you just leave the machine alone, it will make things better. <laughs> you know, that like basically the arc is going to do its own work. We don't have to engage. <laughs> and, and the effects of that are, I mean, engagement in the Iraq war is even one way to understand that. It's like if we just got to help every, everybody get to our perfect, to the utopia that we have achieved, and then it's a steady state. <laughs> and that is a false and dangerous um, I mean, this is after the Reagan revolution when we're already moving in the wrong direction in terms of racial equality, wealth gap, uh, incarceration, but there was sort of a collective belief about history being over. I think we're done with that. <laughs> and I think that is really, really powerful. The leadership uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement has been extraordinary. I mean, you talk about politics, like deep politics, which is not polling, mm -hmm. but leadership mm -hmm. and engaging people in a moral way and changing, changing what is possible. Like those are real moments of strength. 
at the same time, I mean, the, the challenges are enormous. We haven't even talked about something that I see is that we have the court, um, which I, I got very focused on the Amy Go Coney Barrett fight, just saying, you know, oh yeah. Schumer, I don't care if it is a 1.0% chance. The, the cost of this is the Supreme Court that in the name of the Constitution is striking down, has already struck down part of the Voting Rights Act. I'm very concerned. I think it's quite likely that it will strike down Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, it's already gotten rid of uh, the protections against corporate um, uh, money in politics, but okay. there's other protections that can go out. I mean, we are, <laughs> there's, it, it can get worse. So the, the institutional threats are great. And I mean, I have, um, as you mentioned, I'm taking classes at Union in part because I, I am sort of looking for wisdoms <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? and different under, under, and I've already, it's just sort of, it's already helped me see the, the profound theologies in our modern neoliberal um, structure, like what are what what are what is valued? Um, but I but I, I I defer to you on just thinking about how the faith community because I don't feel like I have authority there, but I feel like institutions as institutions are really important because people are really feeling so isolated, lonely, powerless, and they're not wrong to feel that they're seeing growing divisions instead of growing community. So. No, I think you're right. I want to lift up a couple of things you said, and I'll, on our time, we're like four minutes away, so I want to give you the last word, but I, you're right here, and I want to lift up this, what you said so quickly, but it's so powerful, that we have to puncture complacency, right? And so that one of the things I hope that this time has done where we see ourselves in such a fragile and vulnerable state even at a time of this pandemic, this health pandemic, right? That, he, that we see that the people are not, that are supposed to be the fruit and the voice of this democracy aren't respected as people, right? Uh, uh, and so our democracy isn't working. Uh, even in regard to something like this health crisis, uh, that we can't even get money to people, uh, let alone health care to people. Uh, uh, and so hopefully all of this is punctured, as you say so well, the complacency and to think, you know, the, the arc bends toward justice, but it can bend there on its own. No, we got to get on it. As I often say, we got to get on the arc, find a way onto the arc. And so I think that the faith community, if nothing else, has to be the community and the voices that are always puncturing complacency because our values should never change. I often say that we are not accountable to the way things are. We are not accountable to the values of the present. We are accountable to the values of a more just future. And in as much as this nation perhaps accidentally gave vision to this in its Declaration of Independence, gave vision to its better angels, the faith community community has to be the community consistently, not leading us there, pushing us there, uh, right? Because this is who we claim to uh, be about. And so, and not to hide behind this notion of, which is another conversation of separation of church and state, because that the disestablishment clause has nothing to do with being a moral voice uh, on the public square. So I think this is our time uh, that we are, we too are being uh, called in to live into who we claim we are, even as we must push our democracy into its vision of itself. So I wanna leave, you with the last word on this. I can't believe we could go on forever. So this means I'm having you back. Uh, um, but what? my last word is amen. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say to you. So, so, but what's your hope, Zephyr? What, what do you, what do you see as our future? What's your hope? What's your hope for? where we can, let's say if you were looking out four years from now, let's just go four years from now. Where do you hope we can be? 
Wow. So you're holding me accountable to the future that we don't have, I see. <laughs> but you're in divinity school, so this is where you're okay. supposed to be accountable to the future we don't have. Yeah, my hope um, is uh, a deep transformation in our understanding of what is uh, plausible and possible, a transformation in our understanding of the role of history. Yes. And I don't want to be Pollyannish about four years from now, but I can tell you that if we, I'm not going to put it on Biden and Harris, if we <laughs> push Biden and Harris, um, even without a Senate, and I am very excited to see, to uh, ho hopefully that's going to be uh, Reverend Warnock in that Senate, <laughs> um, but even without a Senate, um, that we can push Biden and Harris to totally transform criminal justice, workers' rights, um, uh, take on corporate power in a fundamental way. Um, th and that can happen within four years. And, and once you see the examples, then the truth is victory builds its own energy. Uh, yeah. um, and so I think it is on us to take this question mark of a political moment. And I really think it is a question mark mm -hmm. um, and show that we're going to, people talk about Overton windows. Let's like op open the Overton doors <laughs> right? because there's, it's, it's really not working. So let's go big. Oh, I like that. And I, I like victory. Uh, creates its own energy, and we have seen how evil creates its own energy. And so it's time to live into the good and let that create its own energy and become, I hear you saying, it's time for us to become we the people and to assert uh, our voice as we the people. Zephyr, teach out. Thank you so much for this time. And really, thank you, thank you for your witness and for your voice. And let's see what happens uh, four years from now. But I look forward to future conversations. And thank you. And thank you all for joining us. And I invite you back to our future Just Conversations.